Hello guys, uh, Mo here. So today we're going to do a general chemistry review video that I promised you guys two weeks ago. <laughs> I'm so sorry, it took me longer than it should have been, but life's been really busy and I got sick and uh, the schedule just didn't work out and I couldn't prepare the material on time. But yeah, here we are. Uh, so we're going to do a general chemistry review video. Um, so yeah, let's get going. I just got some notes with me so I don't forget the topics. Uh, I don't forget to mention things that I should be mentioning. So let's start. So this video will cover the general chemistry uh, review. It's the first one in the series. All right. So as I mentioned last week, this will be this is the MCAT uh, general chemistry review. So it won't be like a typical lecture in a class. Um, so we're going to start off with MCAT basics and strategies. Um, kind of talk about how you can better optimize your time and what I've learned in all the research I've done or the books I'm reading. Um, and then you got chemistry fundamentals, the basics, uh, the density, metric units, molecular formulas, um, the stuff that you guys probably, you know, if you're taking your MCAT now, you're a senior in college, the stuff that you learn in your freshman year or so. Um, atoms, periodic trends, you know, just looking at the looking at uh, the periodic table and seeing the trends, bonding and intermolecular forces, uh, pretty important stuff, Lewis dot structure, bond length, um, VSCPR theory, uh, types of bonds, hybridization, polarity. Then we're going to talk about thermodynamics, um, enthalpy, the laws of thermodynamics, uh, reaction energy diagram and stuff, gases, ideal gas law, gas properties, and then one of the most fun topics, acids and bases. Um, we'll, we'll, uh, so in this series, I'm going to talk, in this video, I'm going to talk about acids and bases. But when I do organic chemistry next week, there will be a lot of that too. Um, and then in the end, I just wanted to talk about uh, some basics, you know, definition of logarithms and uh, scientific notation, all the cool stuff there because I feel like a lot of us know what it is but don't know what it really means. Um, all right, let's get started. So MCAT basics. Um, basically, the point I want to get across in this video is that MCAT is not our basic college science test. The ones we're used to, the ones our teachers, you know, the ones you like get lectured on for four weeks and then you just take a test and then you know what's going to be on the test you just prepare for it pull an all-nighter <laughs> don't do that uh, you just you know prepare for it in that sense but so a lot of times it's just memorizing facts formulas and just equations but in the mcat that will not help um, because the mcat is it, the test is testing you how you think under pressure because you're under time crunch you're under the pressure that hey i better not mess this up because this is one of my one of my cri like one of the things I have to do well on to get to med school. So you're under a lot of mental pressure. And so it's like the test is really testing how you do under stress and how you evaluate logic and how do you reason through arguments. Um, so that's one skill we got to get really good at. But does that mean we don't need, we need to, we can ignore the science contact? Absolutely not, because you have to know the basics. Um, so one thing in this video, I'm going to touch on the surface of all these topics because it's not that important to go into details that stuff you don't really need to know because MCAT think about it um, like people there are like these whole books on this whole topic I'm sure like my general chemistry book is was this big my organic is like this big do you think like in 59 or 53 questions they're gonna test us on all this no it's basically the surface and a lot of times what you have to do is you need to know how to apply the knowledge the content you learn so you have to know the you have to have some understanding of the content but you don't need to know everything so review the basics have the foundation down but don't you know don't spend too much time on just memorizing a lot of things know the important stuff strategies so in the science sections there are two types of questions there are freestanding ones and the passages freestanding ones are kind of like um, one could like, hey, how many valence electrons does fluorine has? That's too easy, but things like that, stuff that you should just know. Um, like it just, if you are pre med, most of the time you've taken some good chemistry classes. So a lot of that stuff is pretty foundation, uh, but a lot of it can be hard. A lot of the stuff you probably never thought of, uh, never came across before. Then you got the passages. In passages, you're given a passage, you read through it real quick, and then you have like a few questions to answer based on that. Um, and then one advice that somebody gave me was that if you come across a particularly lengthy question, something that you think is hard, some passage that you start reading and you're like, holy moly, this is uh, pretty big words and I don't understand any of it, skip it for that time. Don't like waste too much time on it because you got like about a minute and a few seconds to answer each question. So if you start spending too much time on the first few passages, at the end you'll be stuck and um, that will not do you much good. 
So just skip it. Ensure that you get the easy questions out of the way because they're all, yeah, just, I mean, it's just like any other test. They're multiple choice. So each question is pretty much worth the same. I don't know. They have some a weird curving system to grade it. But it's, it, just do the easy questions out of the way. Get them done. Because you can always go back. There's like a button called review, I think. And you can go back and um, go back to the question that you left. So yeah, let's start with some chemistry fundamentals, metric units, density, molecular formulas, and uh, balance of equations. Um, I don't actually have my tablet on me, so I'll be I'll try to write on the slides with my mouse. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, basic stuff. We're gonna start off with some metric units um, for the MCAT. Um, so a lot of the stuff is just, I mean, this is mostly BSI units. So the basics of the basics. Um, so as you guys all know. For length is meters. So we use meters for length in the MCAT. Um, I mean, it's, it's a pretty uh, important SI base unit. Then you got kilograms, and that's used for mass. Then you got seconds. We all use it every day. Uh, it's for time. And then moles are one of the most important ones. Uh, if you take any gen chem class, <laughs> moles are like oh, the core of it. It's the amount of substance um, in a solution. And then you got Kelvins. These are um, so. Kelvins are pretty much the standard temperature unit. Um, you do use Celsius Fahrenheit, I mean Celsius Fahrenheit, but a lot of times it gets converted to Kelvin because it makes the calculations easier for gases and uh, pretty standard. Amperes for current, um, and then as you just have to know that. <laughs> we'll talk more about ampere and current in the physics section though. So let's go to the next slide. So multiples of base units. So this is pretty important stuff because a lot of us tend to forget it. Um, so let's start off with nano. So, I mean, there's a lot of buzz going around about nanoparticles. That's what they're talking about is something with the size of 10 to the negative nine, really, really, really small. Um, so nano, just remember that. So if you want to draw this chart when you're doing the MCAT or because a lot of times like conversion questions do pop up and sometimes we all forget, but nano is 10 to the negative nine. You know how I remember that is nine and nano, nine and nano. That's where you start off with negative nine. Okay, micro is ten to the negative six, so just three below. So nano, micro, milli, nano, micro, milli, and the symbol for nano is just capital N. Micro, we all know, is that a little curved U. Um, use that uh, in Gen Chem two or in physics too, as well. Um, so you got micro, which is ten to the negative six. You come three below that, you got a milli. So milliliters or um, millimeters and things like that. So you got milli here, and that gets 10 to the negative 3. So you start off with 10 to the negative 9. How do we remember it? Because 9 is nano. You just step 3 below, that gives you micro. And that's pretty, uh, so like a lot of these, you just have to like find little ways that work for you to kind of remember them because you just have to know these um, basic fundamentals. And then that's just M. Then you go to centimeters. So here the scale kind of changes. So centi is 10 to the negative 2. It's just a C. So 10 to the negative 2 centimeters. They come, uh, they're really important for density and all that. And then you got kilo. Kilo, as we were talking about, kilo is 10 to the 3. So it's, um, we're talking on the positive scale now. So it's bigger, right? 10 to the 3. And then you got 10 to the 3rd. I'm sorry. And then you got mega, which is capital M and 10 to the 6. So here you start coming back. So this, and then you got this, and then just kind of like nano is 10 to the negative 9. So these are multiples of base units that you should know. Next slide. Density. So let's talk about the real gen chem stuff. Um, density is a pretty important um, um, pretty important measurement that's used in chemistry, and it's basically just the mass per volume. I'm going to only touch on the basics of it. I'm not going to go into too much detail because that's pretty very unnecessary in my opinion. So density, you just know the formula. Uh, P equals M divided by V. So P, I mean, I don't know what's the um, real, uh, like, how do you pronounce this actual symbol? It kind of looks like P, so I just go with the P. Uh, like, does it? are they really going to ask me what this is? <laughs> Uh, so this is density um, P, and P is mass over volume. Mass is in grams, volume is in centimeter cubed, right? That's how uh, the, and for volume you use a lot of times you use liters and stuff. 
but the uh, real convention uses centimeter cubed or meter. Meter cubed is too big, so a lot of times it's not convenient for chemists to use it, but centimeter cubed is pretty often used. Um, so I'm going to teach you how, how to solve, like we're going to do a problem next, but here's the basic conversion. So a lot of times what you do is you have kilograms divided by meter cubed, that's the common density units, um, but a lot of times they're grams per centimeter cube they're also used they're pretty equivalent so you can uh, go back and forth on them you can do with conversion um, that's what I mean by equivalent um, so you guys are probably wondering how do we do that so if you have grams per centimeter cubed you want to get to kilograms per meter cubed you just multiply by a thousand okay so if you start with grams and you need to get to kilograms per meter cubed grams divided by centimeter cubed to kilograms divided by meter cubed, um, you just multiply by 1,000, which is multiply by 10 to the third, right? But, however, if you have kilograms per meter cubed, so if you are here and you want to get to the grams per meter cubed, centimeter cubed, so the opposite, you just divide by 1,000, right? Pretty simple. So if you want to, like, if you can't remember it, just write down, um, just, like, write down grams per centimeter cubed, or gram centimeter cubed, set it up, get kilograms per meter cubed, kilograms per meter cubed. It's pretty simple. Like you can just write those two down, and then in the middle, on the top one is multiply by a thousand, bottom one is divide by a thousand, draw the arrows, one is going these way, the other one is going that way. That's how I always remembered it. It's pretty it works. Alright, so if you want to pause uh, on this question and do it on the side um, before continuing on with the video, or um, you can just watch me do it. Um, so the question asks, diamond has a density of 3,500 kilograms per meter cubed. That's the units per density as we talked about in the previous slide. Uh, what is the volume in centimeter cubed of a 1 3 fourth, which is 1.75? So we're going to make sure we write that 1 0.75. It just helps with the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just writing like with my mouse, so it's kind of hard. Um, 1.75 carat diamond. So that's actually good. So let's see what we already know. So we said that density is equal to mass divided by volume, correct? But in this case, we're not looking for density. We are looking for the volume, right? So we got to rearrange our, let's consider this to be an arrow. Uh, so we're going to rearrange our equation. So we're going to have volumes equal um, mass divided by the density. So what happens here is you're going to have some thinking to do. So we got to get our units right, right? So here you have 1.75 and 1 carat equals 0 0.2 grams. So that will be our mass, right? So you take 1.75 actually let me do this. This is my first time playing around with software, so uh, please bear with me. So let's use one different color. One point one point seven five. And then since each one each one carat is equal to zero point two, we take one point seven five, we multiply by zero point point two. And then that's grams. So make sure we get our units straight. Right there. What do you think goes in the bottom? Well, density, right? Well, that's already given. So you got 3,500 kilograms per meter cubed. What do you think would be a good idea? I think a great idea would be to convert that kilograms per meter cubed to grams per centimeter cubed. And how do we do that? We showed you that on the last slide. We just divide this number by a thousand. 3,500 divided by 1,000 gives you 3.5. The reason I converted it is because um, we are given, conveniently, we're given the um, mass in 0 0.2 grams conversion. So in the MCAT, you got to remember tricks like that. Because otherwise, you have no calculator, right? So 3.5 grams divided by centimeter cubed and then oops so you got that down 
and then get the answer. The answer in the MCAT, they won't ask you uh, hard questions like this, but it's always a good idea to have the face down. But the answer I got was 0 0.1. What do you think of the units? So these two would cancel. Oops. So grams would cancel. You're left with just centimeter cubed. Which is the right units for volume. I'm sorry, this is so bad, but you get the point, right? So 0 0.1 centimeter cubed. I know it looks like a kilometer, but it's not. 0 0.1 centimeter cubed, that's the answer I got. Because now you want to check the units, you got this for volume, makes sense, perfect. Let's move on. Next, we're going to talk about molecular formulas. Um, what do you think is the molecular formula of this crazy looking molecule? Hmm? So the name of this molecule is, yeah, you don't really, you should know because uh, we'll talk more about the naming and all that in organic chemistry section next week. But this is called para nitro toluene. Um, para because it's in the para position, nitro because of NO2, and toluene because it's a toluene. And in Tavanera, you have a benzene with a methyl on top. That's called a toluene. Um, so you, how do you determine somebody's molecular formula? Well, molecular formula is nothing more than the atoms that make up that molecule, right? So let's see what you have in here. You have carbon, you have hydrogens, right? You have carbon, 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 and a carbon, right? And then you have an NO2. Each carbon has at least um, one hydrogen attached to it. So you got hydrogen there and H there. You don't have an H here because that will you only can you can only have four bonds to a carbon. You have hydrogen here. You have a hydrogen here. So now we start counting, right? So one, two, three, three hydrogens, three, four, five, six, and seven, right? So we got H7, right? Then you look for carbon. So you have one carbon, two carbons, three, four, five, six, seven. So you also have seven carbons. And then what do you think is left? Well, this NO2, right? So you just put it right there. And one nitrogen, and you got two oxygens. Boom. So this, obviously we were right, so C7, H7, and O2, our answer is confirmed. And now the question asks, what is the molecular rate of para nitrotoluene? that's the name. So the way you determine the molecular rate is we take the number of atoms and we multiply that by their atomic mass number. The atomic mass number is found on the periodic table, and you, uh, I'm pretty sure, yeah, uh, I'm like 100% sure you were given a periodic table in the MCAT. So, all right. I'm pretty sure you are <laughs> um, but yeah so so you got seven carbons right you got seven hydrogens you got one nitrogen and you got two oxygens as mentioned right here these are this 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 and this these are the atomic mass numbers of each of these um, uh, respective uh, atoms so carbon is 12, so you multiply atomic mass of carbon with the number of carbons we have, and then you just add them up. You do that with all of them, and you will get um, grams per mole. So you will get 137 grams per mole. That's a, I forgot uh, a slash there. But you get the point. That will be the molecular rate in grams per mole. Okay, That's how many grams you have per mole on this whole molecule. Next, let's talk about balancing equations. So what happens in balancing equations is that um, the theory behind it is pretty complex, but let's keep it simple. Um, you just gotta have, you look at the reactants, you look at the products, you gotta make sure that the number of atoms are the same. Um, and you just, if they're not, you make them same, right? So here you have one aluminum, you have one hydrogen, one chlorine, right? One of, oops. Let me make this less crooked. So you have one of each. Got it? 
here you have one aluminum, three chlorines, oh boy, we got a problem here, and two hydrogens. So the numbers are not matching up. The best way to do it is just like, so write down aluminum equals one, hydrogen equals one, chlorine equals one. And then on the next line, write down aluminum for products equals one, chlorine equals three, hydrogen equals two. So instead of this, this is pretty easy. This is like the stuff you do uh, early on, pretty basics. Um, so the way you solve it is like you look at what you need to change. So for chlorine, you got three chlorines there and you only have one. So the best idea is to like, you just like plug and chuck numbers and see if it works. A lot of times that's just trial and error. You get better with it over time. So I just plugged in three. And let's see if it works. So three hydrochloric right there. So three in front of hydrochloric acid, ACL. That makes this hydrogen three, three hydrogens and three chlorines, while one aluminum. Aluminum stays as one, so we're not gonna mess with this um, here. So once you do that, what you end up doing is you make three hydrogens as well. But in the products, you only have two hydrogens. So you gotta make some manipulation in the product with hydrogen gas. So you just do three divided by two, and that gives you um, that give you three hydrogens in the products as well. Pretty straightforward. Now let's talk about uh, atoms and periodic trends. That stuff is a uh, pretty important um, because it's, it's fundamentals. Like this video, if it teaches you anything, it's the fundamentals. Like it's not teaching you the the um, the goal of this video is not to teach you like detailed stuff. It's to teach you the surface as I said earlier. So atoms and periodic table. So atoms, as you all know, are the smallest unit of any element. Um, these guys are the mini, 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 mini things. Um, they are so small that uh, I think somebody, the somebody, I once read that uh, human hair is that is like fifty thousand carbon atoms aligned. So the width of a human hair, I mean, you can't even picture that. It's so small, but the, the width of it is like it com consists of fifty thousand carbon atoms. Boom, right? Crazy stuff. Um, so they're really small. They are the smallest unit. And so what happens is inside an atom, you got particles. These particles are known as protons, neutrons, and electrons. Well, where are they located? That's, that's a great question, right? So you, here you see the nucleus. So this is the nucleus right there, right? And here you have eight protons and eight neutrons. I mean, this is the, I, you're not gonna have this number for all of them because this this is for oxygen, all right? I just may, I just choose oxygen for it because oxygen is a, is a very commonly used atom. Um, and it keeps us alive, right? So um, here you have oxygen. So in oxygen's nucleus, you have eight protons and eight neutrons, all right? I'm gonna explain what it means later. So. You have that, and then you got these red dots, right? You all see them, these ones right here. There are eight of them as well. What these red dots represent are the electrons. They are just running in the electron cloud. They're just orbiting or in the orbitals. Um, so central nucleus equals protons and neutrons, while the outside of nucleus are the electrons, or outside nucleus meaning these like uh, circles, um, AKA, the electron cloud, aka the orbitals, um, yep. or the uh, valence shells, people have different names for it. But what does this all tell you? Like what, so I have these numbers here, eight, eight, eight. What does that really mean? Well, the number of protons and the number of neutrons, the stuff that is located in the nucleus, that is what makes up the atomic mass number of an atom. So that's the stuff you see on the periodic table. That's the stuff, that's what I used to solve the previous problem for uh, molecular weight. Um, that's that's really important. So the number of um, atom, uh, number of protons and neutrons inside the nucleus, e are equal to the mass number. All right. Then you have the electrons. So what are the electrons used for? Oh, I made a mistake. So this is not supposed to be protons. This is supposed to be. What do you guys think this is supposed to be? This is supposed to be. I already said it. So this is supposed to be. The electrons. I can barely write, but so like number of electrons is what is what makes up the atomic number. And I'm gonna in the next slide I'm gonna show you what that exactly means. So actually, so periodic trends. So on the next one I'm gonna show you the makeup of it. But I thought periodic trends are pretty 
it, it just shows you the overall layout of the whole um, atomic numbers and masses. So if you look at all of this, so groups are the vertical ones. So you have, so you, so you got rows and you got columns. Groups are called the, uh, are, are the columns inside periodic table. They go from up and down, right? However, the stuff that goes from rows, from left to right, these are called periods. Period. I know the I before that, but who cares? Uh, irrelevant. <laughs> um, so this is all. Everything you see in red are the metals. You have non-metals here. There are some alloys here. Just know that these are transition metals. Um, we don't really mess with them. In the bottom, you have lanthanides and actinides, and um, those aren't really that important. Um, so just, just know the basics, as I said earlier. Nonmetals on the right, metalloids in the in the in that little like green section right here. These are the metalloids, and then here you have all the metals. Then you have hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen is here because it only has uh, because of its atomic number. But hydrogen is a nonmetal. We all know that, right? Cool. Let's go to the next slide. Actually, uh, let's talk about the periodic trends here because I feel like it's really. Uh, so this is the only time I'm going to show you guys the periodic table. So atomic radius decreases as you go from left to right. So as you go to the right in periods, as I said here, so you go 1, 2, 13, 14, 15. As you go to the right, protons, the number of protons increase, right? That's the reason that the, I'm sorry, the number of protons increase. So what happens is atomic radius decreases as the number of uh, protons increase. Uh, the theory behind it is not that sophisticated, but I don't want to go into it. So just know that atomic radius decreases as you go from left to right. It increases as you go from right to left across the periodic table. Electronegativity, however, increases as you go from left to right. So the bigger the atom, the more electronegativity it would have. So So the most electronegative atom is fluorine right here. It's the most electronegative atom there is in periodic table. And then the more least electronegative is francium, which is right here. So just know atomic radius decreases as you go to the right. Electronegativity increases as you go to the right. Basically, those are the two most important trends that um, I want to talk to you guys about. And then you got acidity. Acidity is also how well a compound donates. Um, I'm going to talk about that later in the acids and bases sections. But acidity is also another important trend. And what happens with acidity is that acidity, I'm just trying to use a color I haven't used before, um, acidity increases as you go down periodic table. Okay? Just know that. So let me break it down to you the third time. So you got atomic radius, which decreases as you go to the right. You got electronegativity, which increases as you go to the right. Then you got acidity, which increases as you go downwards, downwards towards the right. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. I don't confuse you guys anymore. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So back to the individual. So individual, um, individual atoms on periodic table. So when they're labeled or when they're on a periodic table, what does that mean? So here you have nitrogen. Nitrogen is seven, atomic number seven, and then you have the atomic weight of 14. Remember I told you about the atomic number? Atomic number is just the number of electrons in an atom, whereas atomic weight consists of the number of protons per number of plus numbers of number of uh, neutrons. Chemical name is nitrogen, chemical symbol is this. Pretty straightforward. Now let's go to the Lewis dot structures, bond length, and dissociation energy. So Lewis dot structures, they are pretty important, as we all know. Um, move this real quick. Um, they're all pretty important. So what happens is Lewis dot structures, they are each. So let's see how I can put this better. Um, so we use Lewis dot structures one of, as, as one of the models to represent what compounds look like at a molecular level. This is, I know this is a lot of 
words, I guess, but, but what it means is that at the molecular level, what do these atoms look like, right? At the most basic form, where do they look like? It helps us understand the reactivity of that one atom, okay? Keep that in mind. So then you are like, all right, Mo, what are, where are all these dots, right? I have showed you guys that in the previous few slides, but each dot represents one of the valence electrons, in this case, for fluorine. So fluorine has seven um, valence electrons. As you can see, it does have seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, I'm going to talk about the octet later. Um, so here you have F2. F2 is the molecule. So that means you have two fluorine atoms bonding together, forming a single bond. So the first thing you do is you find out the valence electrons, or not the valence electron. Um, the valence electron, are, so you find out the atomic number of that atom, which is the number of valence electrons in the atom, okay? No, the electrons in the, uh, in the valence shells. So you have seven for fluorine. You find that out on periodic table. And since there are two fluorines, you multiply that by two, which gives you 14. Um, that number 14, so you put two fluorines right next to each other. And what you do is you start putting these dots, these 14 dots all around us. So you start here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So you have managed to fit them all in here. What happens is then, so for the bond, it's like I've seen it both ways. A lot of times people just put them as the dots, as the Lewis dot structure. Sometimes you can also put a single bond there because it's like so kind of like commonly used, so basic, I guess, that people just ignore it. Um, but each dot represents one of fluorine's valence electrons. But this is the basic dot structure. So you find out the atomic find out the um, the atomic number of that atom. You get it for the other atoms in that molecule. You um, add them up, and this is the number you get. And then you just plug them in, and then you see um, a lot of times they match right up. And another thing you have to keep in mind here is that octet configuration. So what, what octet means is that the atoms in the main group of elements that tend to combine in such a way that each atom has eight electrons in its valence shell. So what it means is here, if you look, so these two fluorines, they both have eight valence electrons, which normally they don't. So normally they have seven, right? So here you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This fluorine has eight, eight right here. And so does the other fluorine, one, two, like that's the reason they bond, right? Because they're both sharing. It's a covalent bond, so they're both sharing. And it's a um, non-polar covalent bond because it's an equal sharing of electrons. They're both electronegatively equivalently strong. It's not like you have water where oxygen is just pulling the electron density away from the hydrogens. Here, you both have, you just have fluorine. They're the same thing. So um, they're just like, both of them are just like this. It's the non-polar covalent bond, which we'll talk about in the next few slides. So that's how you do Lewis star structures. Next, let's talk about bond dissociation energy, what that is. Um, this stuff is pretty important to think of and just keep it in the back of your head. So and there's a lot of energy that's required to break a bond homolytically. Um, so that formed the bond that we uh, formed in the previous slide was F2. Here you have Cl2. Um, they're both in the same, uh, they're both in the same group on periodic table, so the same number of valence electrons. But here, you have one electron of the bond being broken goes to each fragment of the molecule so what you have is you just split them up as you can see here they just break apart it's a homolytic cleavage so what happens is you, each one of them end up with the one radical or one electron unpaired electron radicals we talk about next week in the organic but this is what it looks like just simple stuff nothing to really worry about then you got types of bonds you have covalent bonds ionic, sigma, pi. I've just chosen these. There's, there, for sure there are more. Um, I know for a fact, but I just kept them out for the length of this video and because they're not as important. So you have covalent bond. Covalent bond, as I said earlier, are the bonds that are formed between two nonmetals. Two nonmetals when each contribute one or more of its unpaired electrons, as, as, in, the, as in the case of F2 or Cl2. 
these are the covalent bonds. They are pretty strong. They're pretty strong bonds. And um, then you have right next to them is ionic. Ionic bond between a metal and a non-metal. A great example I can give you guys is salt. So Na Oops, sorry about that. Let's see if I can do this. So NaCl. Okay. So Na is a sodium, is a metal. Chlorine is a non-metal, right? So you just put them both together, and this is this, that makes salt. And salt has ionic bonds. Uh, resulting so what happens is you have Na if you look at periodic table I don't know what group it is in but it's a positively charged then you have chlorine which is very negatively charged so you always have that uh, resulting in positive or negative ions which attract each other remember that's chemistry for you <laughs> positive and negative being attracted to each other and you got sigma bonds sigma bonds are pretty important in organic chemistry um, these are they are the both they consist of two electrons that are localized between two nuclei. Um, this will make much more sense when you start drawing them, um, but just know that there are two electrons that are localized between two nucleuses. Okay. Pi bonds, on the other hand, are formed by parallel side-to-side -side alignment of two unhybridized p orbitals. This will all make sense when we do organic, as then then we'll start to draw. But just know that these kind of bonds exist in a sigma bond and pi bond. A lot of sigma bonds a single bond. Pi bond is a sigma bond which also has, is, pi bonds only exist in um, alkenes or alkynes, which we'll talk about next. It's really hard to um, teach you guys this then when we don't have the basics for organic yet. Um, so unhybridized p orbitals on adjacent atoms. So what you have is two unhybridized p orbitals and these, uh, these pi bonds are formed parallel side to side uh, and they align like that. So here, Let's talk about so those are the intramolecular forces now we're talking intramolecular between uh, they are so these forces are relatively weak um the weak interactions that take place between neutral molecules you gotta remember that first one we're going to talk about is london dispersion um here it just says dispersion but full name is london like the city of london uh, london dispersion and it's present in all molecules and atoms and what it does is that it's been the negative partially negative atoms partially positive and see here, so you have one atom with partially positive, one part, one atom on another molecule is partially negative, and they're both being attracted. See these dots in the middle, right there, right there. Um, so these dots represent this intermolecular force of London dispersion, and that's all basically it is. Strength-wise, it's not as strong. See here, the strength increases as we go down. Yep. Then you have dipole, dipole. Dipole dipole happens in polar molecules. What's the most famous polar molecule that you know of? Water, right? You all know water. This example doesn't include water, but um, water, is, water is the most common one, and dipole dipole happens in water. So in, what happens here is that you have positively negative ones, partially positive, um, and it's just this one is present in polar molecules where another dispersion is present in all molecules and atoms, okay? So for dipole dipole to happen, you have to be polar. You have to have unequal sharing of electrons. Okay. Then you got hydrogen bonding, my favorite. Uh, this is what makes water have all those crazy unique um, unique uh, properties that allows life to survive. Um, because we're 71% water, right? Um, so these are the molecules containing hydrogen bonded to fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. In water's case, it's the oxygen. But you can also have fluorine or nitrogen. So what happens here is, so you have that's this is this is the water actually. So you have uh, oxygen there. Let's choose a different color. So you have oxygen here, bonded to two hydrogens. I can't even draw here. So two hydrogen. Just sorry about that. You guys know what I'm talking about. So you have uh, two hydrogens with oxygen and oxygen here you see these dots so oxygen here is hydrogen bonding with the hydrogen from the other other molecule same is happening here you have the same oxygen uh, hydrogen hydrogen bonding with the other hydrogen so oxygen to hydrogen 
these are hydrogen bonding is one of the stronger ones is uh, ion dipole uh, I mean you barely ever hear about this one but this is present in mixture of ionic compounds and polar compounds but this has more flexibility in where it can exist in um, but it's basically pretty much the same concept where you have partially negative atoms um, they are uh, forming uh, intermolecular interaction with the positive atoms that's all you need to know but remember hydrogen bonding happens between hydrogen bonded to fluorine oxygen or nitrogen dipole dipole only in polar molecules and in dispersion in all molecules okay these are the intramolecular on the previous slide covalent ionic sigma and pi bonds over intramolecular forces um, hybridization so as i said in the for uh, pi bonds where you have two unhybridized p orbitals and they're aligned uh, parallel these are that's what i meant so here you have s orbital p orbital then you have d orbital and then you have f orbital in organic chemistry you only go till here but in general, because of periodic table, these are determined by where your location is on the periodic table. So it's determined by how many electrons you have in your valence shell. Uh, or simply put, what is your atomic number? Based on the atomic number, these are given to you. So you have S block. Just, um, if I were you, I would just look it up. So you have S block on the periodic table, P block, D block, and F block on the bottom. Uh, that's what these really represent. That's what they look like in three-dimensional space. So, but you guys are probably wondering that how how are how are we gonna apply this in in MCAT? So a lot of times what happens is this is probably the most useful application of these. Um, so if you look at this right here, you have two uh, carbons. So that's an ethane, um, right? Um, so you have ethane right here. So this bond right here, the MCAT asks you to find the hybridization of this molecule. Well, so you have two carbons that are both attached to each other. They each have three, bond, I mean four bonds, right? So you have one hydrogen, one right there, two right there, three right there, and four right there. What that means is you have one S orbital and three Ps, right? Because you have four bonds. And that's what, you just count the numbers. That's the best way my professor has taught me and I always stuck with me. So you have four bonds, four bonds attached to that carbon, and four is P3, so three right there and one right there, sp3. sp3 is equal to four bonds, okay? Same with the next one, it's exactly the mirror image of it, so it's sp3 as well. You go to the alkenes, which is ethene in this case, you added a pi bond right here, but that does, I mean, this is, not, this is not an ethene. This is a little more complicated. You have another methyl here. Uh, I'm not even gonna show you guys how to name this because we'll talk about that in the next video, but. Um, here you have, so whenever you have a, a pi bond, you still count it as one. So that's a big mistake people make. So you, so how many bonds are attached to this? Well, you have one, two, three. You count this whole thing as one. Okay, so that's why you have sp2 and not sp3 because one, two, three. You only count that as one because it's a pi bonds. You only count the sigma bonds. Okay, I hope that makes sense. CH3 still has three hydrogens plus one here, so she still has four. That makes it still an sp3. Okay? Here you have an alkyne, so you have three bonds right here, right? One sigma and two um, uh, pi bonds. So you have sp because one and two, same scenario. You only count the sigma bonds and you only have one here, so one there, one here. So one and two, that makes it sp. And then here you still have the same old CH3, same old methyl group hanging out, which has been the same throughout, which is sp3, which is right here. Hope that makes sense. Um, it's not supposed to be that complicated. So yeah, it's pretty basic. Just giving you guys an overview here. Next, we're gonna talk about thermodynamics. It's cool stuff. Let's move on. The system and surroundings, as I said earlier, are pretty big concepts, right? So what it means is that when you're, whenever you're calculating the thermodynamic or entropy to any of the thermodynamical values, you need to have a system because a system is the stuff you are you care about. That's where the energy flow. I mean, that's what you can calculate. Surroundings is everything that is not in the system, right? That makes sense because here, let's say you have a system that you want to calculate so you just put a boundary on it so this boundary helps you determine the actual factors inside the system for your mathematical calculations 
that we're going to talk about next. System is the something that is that the work is being done on. So here in the bottom, I have two statements that say when energy flows into the system from the surroundings, the energy of the system increases, right? So you have energy coming in, right? What that does is that the energy of the system increases, but when you have energy of the system flowing out, that's when you have the energy system decreasing. So when you have this happening, right? Or you have this happening, same thing, right? That's when the energy of the system is decreased. So you're, I mean, that makes intuitive sense, right? But that you keep that in mind for the next slide. So enthalpy is also another big concept that you guys have all heard of, I'm sure, come across in your gen chem classes, um, or even a little bit in organic. Um, so enthalpy is the heat energy, is the measure of heat energy that is released or absorbed when bonds are broken. And form during a reaction that's run at constant pressure. So constant pressure is what you want to keep in mind here. So when a bond is formed, energy is released. So when, when you have like, uh, let's say you have fluorine, as, as I mentioned in a few slides earlier. So you have two fluorines, they form a sigma bond, right? That's when a bond is formed. So energy is going to be released, right? That's when delta H is less than zero. So delta H is negative when the bond is formed. So it's kind of the opposite. Remember that because it follows that the, since the energy is released and it's the heat energy that is released, so you let the system lost energy, delta H is negative. And when you have the bond, so energy must be put into bond in order to break it. So in order to break that bond, you're gonna to need to put in the energy, right? So forming it, delta H is negative, but breaking it, delta H is positive because you're putting in the energy because you can, things just don't break by themselves. You have to put in energy, right? That's when delta H for the heat energy is positive. And then you have heat of reaction. So this I can go in a lot of detail. It's a pretty big topic also. Like all of these are pretty big topics, but I'm just showing you guys the basics here. The formula. So delta H, the formula is delta H products minus reactants. When I ever see the delta sign in chemistry or almost in any other scientific uh, scientific uh, discipline, the delta, just delta in front of that means products minus reactants. It's just the difference. So here you have an endothermic reaction versus exothermic. So what's the difference? Well, in endothermic reaction, you have delta H that is positive. So that is when um, that is when the energy is, um, as I mentioned earlier, the energy is coming into the system. Um, so you here you have reactants starting here, right? And products ending here. So you have a lot of difference right there. So what this means is that the system did not lose any energy, it actually gained energy. Um, that's what it means to be endothermic. On the other hand, you have exo. Exo means, you know, exiting. Um, just the uh, SO, I always remembered it, negative, right? So you have starting off here and boy, you lose some energy there, right? That's what an exothermic is. Pretty basic stuff, just know that that's what energy diagrams look like for uh, endothermic versus exothermic. Entropy, on the other hand, all processes tend to run in a direction that leads to maximum disorder. As I said, my room gets nasty every three months, right? It gets dirty. It gets a little messy because, I mean, part of it, I mean, <laughs> entropy happens at such a slow rate, um, but it is spontaneous. And if you put some energy in it, you will see that the, uh, that it tends, it's very spontaneous to go towards entropic states. So what entropy you calculate is that you do the same thing. Um, there's a different formula for it, but in gen chem section, I'm not going to talk about it, the actual formula for entropy. But in delta S, you just do products minus reactions that I described earlier. Here, I have an example for you guys. So when randomness increases or order decreases during the reaction, then delta A is positive for the reaction. So here you have one molecule, right? So you're starting off with carbonic acid. Um, here you have one. You have water and you have carbon dioxide. So in the reactants, you have one. In the reactants. In the reactants, you have one molecule. The products. Oh, you have two. It's not good. Well, that means entropy increase. So you go from one to two, right? So one to two. That what that does is that entropy increased, and that means delta S is positive for that reaction. General entropy rules. Um, 
the first one is so these are general ones and uh, that's what MCAT is really about the foundation the basics uh, it's the, the really important stuff that is like you just have to know but it's you don't have enough time on the exam to actually like work around in your head so number one liquids have more entropy than solids I mean, that makes sense right liquids are more uh, disordered than solids um, Next, gases have more entropy than solids and liquids. Gases are oh, spread everywhere, right? Those molecules they have, like they, they don't have much volume restrictions, so they are more um, disordered. Particles in solutions have more entropy than undissolved solids. That makes sense, right? In solution, they have more entropy than undissolved ones. So these are just general rules. I'm sure you guys already know it. Um, two moles of a substance have more entropy than one mole, as we said on the previous one. Where you started off with carbonic acid as one molecule and you got split into carbon dioxide and water. So two moles in the products obviously had more entropy than that one mole. That makes sense. The value of uh, the value of delta S for a reverse reaction has the same magnitude as that of the forward reaction of the opposite sign. So if you calculated the entropy value for the for the reactants, let's say, uh, for the products, let's say, so you calculate the delta S for products. In order to calculate the delta S for the opposite side, you just switch the sign. So your magnitude stays the same, but you just change the signs from positive to negative or negative to positive. Now let's talk about Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy is a pretty important topic in gen chem. Um, and what that is, is just a free energy that's available. And the most important formula, and I feel like in thermodynamics for the MCAT, will be this one right here, which is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Delta G is the Gibbs free, delta H, as I mentioned earlier, is the enthalpy, T is the temperature, delta S is the entropy. So, a few things to also keep in mind here. Gibbs free energy is the energy that's available to do useful work for a chemical reaction. So you see a lot of this in, even used in biochemistry because you're, doing chemi you're dealing with the chemical reactions, right? So here you have delta G. When delta G is negative, that's when you know it's spontaneous in the forward direction because that's when the entropy is, is, is greater than the enthalpy. Um, because, I mean, this is all mathematical. I, I mean, it's, it just makes intuitive sense. When this increases, when this increases and this, like, this, when this is more than, when entropy is greater than enthalpy, you're going to have a negative delta G, right? That's how this equation works. That means it's spontaneous in the forward direction. Delta G is zero, that means this side and this side are equivalent. That means it's at equilibrium. If delta G is greater than zero or it is positive, that means non-spontaneous in the forward direction. Does that make sense? Because um, when delta G is greater, that means delta H is more than delta S. Um, that means it's non-spontaneous because entropy is the only thing that's spontaneous in this sense, unless other energies are added. So reaction energy diagrams. So in the previous slide we talked about um, endothermic and exothermic. Here you have endogonic, endergonic, and exergonic. Same kind of concept. Exergonic reactants when they when the energy is released, delta G is negative here, right? So you lost all of that. So you see right there, reactants started off higher in the energy levels. And then go decrease here you have on the under endergonic so this is the positive this is when the energy is absorbed right here by the system and this is where you start off low for the reactant but you increase way higher for the products during the course course of the reactions and delta g which is the equation i showed you guys in the last slide delta g equals delta h minus t delta s here you have delta g um, as I said from four or five slides ago, that whenever you see a delta, that means it's products minus reactants. And that's what determines. Um, so if you want to find out delta G of a certain reaction between two different, two different, uh, uh, like two, uh, between the reactant products, you just do that. You just subtract products minus reactants. That'll give you the delta G, and then you just graph it. And that energy diagram will look like this. If it's endergonic, that means you'll have more energy for the product. If it's exergonic, you'll have more energy for the reactants. Now let's talk about gases, uh, important stuff. So, the, so there are some properties of gases. That's what I want to start off with. Um, so gases, um, for, there are a few uh, important properties of gases. And um, so you have pressure, volume, and temperature. These are three of the most important ones. Um, volume, let's start with volume. Volume is an SI unit for volume, as I mentioned on the first or second slide. 
volume is usually calculated in liters um, in meters cubed here in this case because um, even though meter cubes as I said earlier is not very convenient because it's so big it's so inconvenient to use in the lab setting so a lot of times you use liters or cubic centimeters um, as these are all SI units and then you have pressure pressure is force per unit area right um, SI is a Pascal SI unit is Pascal for pressure um, but you can always do conversions go back and forth so one Pascal equals one Newtons per meter squared okay one Pascal equals one Newtons per meter squared Newton is a force right from physics and a meter squared is the area then you have another conversion is uh, so these are just some numbers that you should like you know have in the back of your head um, so you have one ATM on the atmospheric pressure equals 760 torres, which is 760 millimeters mercury, which equals 101.3 kilopascal. Okay, um, a lot of times you don't really need to really, really know what these each mean, like what tor means, and all that. We can go into details, but not really necessary, just know the numbers. Um, and a lot of times I feel like MCAT will give you these because it's only fair to do that. Um, because as doctors, you're now. <laughs> You're never going to need to uh, do this on top of your head. A lot of times, the computers will do it for you. And then you have temperature. When dealing with gases, the best unit for expressing temperature is Kelvin. And how you probably guys are probably wondering how do you go from Kelvin from Celsius to Kelvin? Well, you take Celsius. Let's say it's um, uh, 27. Just let me see. I messed up. But. So let's say it's 27, right? So what you would do is you just add, right? So 273.15 plus 27 is 300. Well, roughly 300. Um, so that is your temperature in Kelvin. It's just take the Celsius, add it to your, right there. Just add it to your uh, 273.15. The ideal gas law. So the volume, the temperature, pressure, ideal gas are all related by a single equation um, so there are a lot of other equations to calculate pressure volume the Dalton's and there's like um, there are like three or four other ones but I'm not going to talk about those because they're not as important most of the time you can solve those problems with ideal gas law uh, so P and that stands for the pressure of the gas in atmospheres volume stands for the container uh, in liters N is the number of moles in the gas R is the universal gas constant it's all is 0.0821 liters ATM divided by kilometers per mole, not kilo, kilowatts per mole. <laughs> I know it's late, but temperature is the absolute temperature of gas. So basically, PV equals NRT. PV equals NRT. I'm sure you guys have know this on top of your head um, because Gen Chem 2, the class you take for organic, that just consists of all of this. PV equals NRT. Now let's talk about some acids and bases. So what happens with these is that um, the, uh, a lot of people get confused on the definitions. Um, so there are three different definitions for acids and bases in, in general chemistry. Um, and But the difference between these three is that um, their range, of the, their, um, their vastness in definition, some of them are really narrow definitions, while some are really broad. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So the first one, the first definition that we had rest of the basis of Arrhenius. That was the most basic one. And we soon we found out we're like, this does not cover all the cases. But what that does was Arrhenius said was acid, the substance which produces H plus ions. Um, so anything that uh, produces H plus is an ion, is, uh, is an acid. Anything that produces an OH minus is a base. Okay. So that's what Arrhenius said. Broster Lurie came over and he later and he said, acids and bases, the concept is about protons. If you are a proton donor, you're an acid. And if you, if you accept that proton, if you're the acceptor, then you are the base. That's Broster Lurie. He was dealing with the protons. Later on, Lewis comes along. And this is probably the most wide, um, gives us more room. This is probably the uh, very most commonly used definition of acids and bases. Doesn't mean the others are wrong. But um, 
right now is very well accepted because of the ring, this, this, the scope it handles. So Lewis um, are electron pair acceptors. Lewis assets are electron pair acceptors. They are the ones accepting the electron pair. Bases, on the other hand, are the electron pair donors. They are the ones that donate electrons. Okay? All right, so now we're going to talk about conjugate acid, conjugate bases. Here you have ammonia, water reacting, right, in a solution. And uh, ammonia is the base, and water is the acid. According to Lewis, acids are the electron acceptors, right? And ammonia is the electron donor. So what happens is we have ammonia giving up its lone pair to, oops, let me change the color. So there's another one there. So ammonia going over to this H, grabbing it, and this lone pair going back to oxygen. And that's exactly what you see here. You have this hydrogen attaching to ammonia right here, making it a positively charged molecule and then water, that lone pair gets back to water, that one right there, the point, I know the arrows are bad, but um, hopefully you guys get a gist of it. So you have a positive and a minus. So acids turn into conjugate bases, and bases turn into conjugate acids. Um, I guess the best way to remember it, just like this, the opposite, right? So you have base turning into a conjugate acid, you have acid turning into a conjugate base. So basically, perfectly, perfectly follows the Lewis definition. Um, as I showed you guys in the previous slide. Then you have the strength. So whether an acid, so you know, you guys have probably heard of like a strong acid versus a weak acid. This concept is really, really, really popular in organic chemistry or really useful because what happens is you have strong acids um, that are competing against weak acids and that determines the reactivity or the reaction mechanisms that you need to do later. Um, but this is not organic, so we're not going to get too deep into it. So whether an acid is strong or weak, it depends on how completely it ionizes in water. So if an acid ionizes completely in water, it's a very strong acid. So a strong acid, like a hydrochloric acid, dissociates completely in water, right? Strong acid dissociates completely in water. And what that means is that you have HCl and water, right? HCl is an acid, so it's the, it's the um, uh, here you have the, um, here you have the water, the lone pairs from the base um, coming over, grabbing that hydrogen. And what that does is makes water H3O plus and chlorine minus. Um, strength of the base is directly, however, on the other hand, you have strength of the base, right? So here, how completely it ionizes in water, that's what determines how strong of an acid it is. Here you have the strength of the base, on the other hand, so which is directly related to how much the product is favored over the reactions. That stuff is pretty important too. Um, so it's not exactly the same definition of an acid. So an acid, strength of acid is determined by how completely it ionizes water. Strength of the base is directly related to how much the product is favored over the reactants. So ammonia is a weak base. So some things to keep in mind is ammonia is a weak base. On the other hand, the strong bases include hydroxides, oxides and metal, amides, and NH2, um, lithium oxides, sodium hydroxide, and barium oxide. All right, you have pH. I'm sure you guys have all seen this like good looking scale from like going from all the way to acidic from lemon juice to all the way to bleach, which is very basic. So, you guys are probably wondering, like, what is pH, right? pH scale measures the concentration of H plus ions. Um, that's just the H plus, that's the concentration, right? So, P of a pH equals the negative log of H plus. Um, the one thing to remember is anything greater than seven is basic. So anything greater than seven is basic. Anything equals to seven is acidic, and anything less than seven is acidic. So basic is greater than seven, acidic is less than seven, and when it is seven, it's neutral. Obviously, it's at equilibrium. All right? Buffers. So buffer is a solution that resists changing pH. So just remember these three words. So in a given solution, if you have a buffer in it, it will resist the changing pH and a small amount of acid or base is added. So when an extra disturbance is added to the solution, a buffer inside of it will resist that change. It really helps you in, us, in human body because uh, in blood to keep a neutral pH. Um, what happens is the presence of a weak acid and its conjugate base 
or a weak acid is conjugate acid, so it can be vice versa in, in roughly equal concentrations. Um, so this is when a buffer is really important. But whenever you add a whenever you add a weak acid uh, or whenever you add any acid to a normal um, pH solution, things tend to change, right? You tend to change the pH, but buffers resist that, and that really helps sometimes. Um, we're going to talk about henderson heck hasselbalch in biochemistry, but with that is this another way of calculating the pH. Um, at, um, so as you're adding the acid, um, this really like this pH equals pKa plus log base 10 a um, base or the construction of base or construction of acid. This equation helps you calculate that pH at that um, at that amount of uh, solution added, solid added. Okay, we'll talk more about that biochem uh, section, which will be in, in the week after next week. Tight. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is definition of logarithms and scientific notation and what it means to us or how, how is it calculated. So, logarithm is another name for just log. For short, it's an exponent, it's just an exponent. So, you have log base a to the y, okay? a is the base equals x if and only if y equals a to the x. So, that's the mathematical way of saying it, but let's say log to the base 3 to the 9, okay? What that means is that, so we're going to need to determine the x value, right? So, equals x. Well, x is the same as 3 right here, which is our base. You put the x on top, equals 9. So what power, what to the power of, uh, uh, what, what is 3 to the power of, that will give you 9? 2, right? 3 to the 3 squared. 3 squared equals 9, and that's all it is. That's all a log is. So whenever you are you, you come across a log problem that you don't understand, just write. So like just I would just write log of 3 to the 9, and I know the answer is 2, right? It's because this is what we're looking for. So it'll just help you remember what our log is because it's just an exponent. Okay. Next, let's talk about scientific notation. So, scientific notation is very well, very commonly used. The way it works is so all of you guys have seen this. This is the Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Um, what it signifies is that um, here you have count the numbers of zeros with me. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. So you have 23 numbers before you get to the first number, right? Start counting from left to right. Um, so you have 6.02 times 10 to, the 9, 10 to the 23rd. So if you want to shorten that up, so you can also do 60.2 times 10 to the 22nd. So this is the uh, another short way of writing big numbers. So here you have negative 3.5, y negative, because there's a negative there, right? There's a negative there. 3.5, so you put a period there, and then you calculate 1, 2, count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then you end up with this number. That's basically scientific notation. So uh, let's simplify a problem for you. Um, let's do a problem together. So you have 4 times 10 to the negative third, and then you're multiplying it by 5 times 10 to the 9. So the best way to do it is take 4, take 5, all right, multiply them, and then time that whole thing by 10, because they're both power, they're both on the same basis. So you have base 10 right here and here, right? And then what this does is, so 10 to the negative third plus 9, and then you Multiplying this together will give you this. Multiplying this together, I mean, not multiplying, but adding. So 9 plus 3 minus 3 equals 6. And then you have the answer is 2 to the 2 times 10 to the 7. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense because here you just put a period there, so 2.0, and you increase the exponent there. This is another way of writing it because you always want the scientific notation to be um, written like this shortest. 
all right hopefully this video helped um if you guys have any questions or any improvements for next videos please leave it leave it in the comments i would love to read about them because i know this needs a lot of improvement but i'm looking for feedback um yeah hopefully in this process of me preparing for my mcat helps you guys too and that way we can keep each other accountable on what we're studying and um just yeah rock this test out because definitely not an easy test seven and a half hours long filled with content testing everything that you've never really been tested before for pressure and just you know that willingness to um because we all have that big dream of becoming doctors one day and just yeah so we'll keep each other accountable and please give me any feedback that you guys have i'd love to hear back have a great night or not i shouldn't fly just you guys can be watching this during the day um have a great day. Good luck. Keep studying hard. Peace out.